I missed you guys last week. I was sick, but I am better, so. Glad you're better. Thank you. Anybody remember what we were talking about the last time I was here? Because <laughs> I think the, the week before that, something else was going on. So it's been a while. Anybody remember? It was an ology. It was an ology. All right, good. You get 10 points for that. Okay, we were talking about anthropology, about mankind. I think we had finished with how we were related to Adam's sin. Anybody remember that? Anybody tell me what some of the views were on that? It's a good thing we don't have exams here. So what's, what's the, uh, the natural view? What's one of the views where, where the sin of Adam is passed to us through his physical seed? So if you're, if you're born into humanity, which I think every single one of us is, that's, that's how his sin, was, his sin nature was passed on to us. What's another view? What was the view that I said I kind of leaned towards? Okay, okay, it's, it's called, what's called the federal view. In other words, Adam was our representative, just like Jesus is our representative. So Adam represented all of humanity, just as Jesus represents all of those who put their faith in him. So Paul talks about in Romans 5 how, as through one man Adam sin entered the world, so through one man Jesus comes righteousness and salvation. All right, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer before we get into today's lesson. <clears throat> Father, thank you uh, for this time, and thank you, thank you that we can sing these songs, and thank you for those who have written them and the music that goes with them. Thank you that some of these songs, um, even though they may be silly, they last for ages, and they're a good reminder to us of the joy that we have in you. So guide us and direct us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to finish up on um, anthropology. Do you have your outlines? Because if not, I do have some extra if you lost them or threw them out. <laughs> we're going to talk about what's often called uh, the difference between trichotomous and dichotomous. Have anybody ever heard that expression before? Know what it refers to? Is mankind two parts or three parts? Is he body, spirit, and soul? Or is he body and spirit? So time for a vote. How many of you think it's where body, soul, and spirit? How many of you think we're just body? or material part and immaterial part. I just changed it on you. So if those of you who said uh, body, soul, and spirit, what, where do you have your, uh, your proof for that? Where? And if you believe in three parts, are the soul and the spirit an actual entity? Wouldn't it be like the, your soul is what the spirit enters? Your soul is what the spirit enters. Okay, so would that be trichotomous or dichotomous? Well, once you have a spirit, you would be free. Okay, so what are you are you kind of saying that some people have a spirit and others don't? Okay, so that, that's how some people look at it, that as Christians we're trichotomous, body, soul, and spirit, that the spirit is actually the Holy Spirit who comes and enters into us. So yeah, that could be it. But, so the idea is that there's a material part and an immaterial part. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is the major verse that 
gives us the trichotomous view. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, that's probably the main verse that shows that we have these three parts. <coughs> but even in understanding those three parts, like we said, uh, the Spirit may be a reference to actually the Holy Spirit coming into our lives. We have the Spirit of God within us. And so in many ways it's only Christians who have that three parts. Now, is that the best way to look at ourselves? What about other parts? What about our mind? What about the heart? The Bible talks a lot about the heart. The Bible talks about the conscience. The, talk, the Bible talks about our bowels. You know, we, we tend to use the phrase of things like, I love you from the depths of my heart. <coughs> we think of the heart as the seat of the emotions. The Greeks thought of the bowels as the seat of the emotions. So on Valentine's Day, they would say, I love you from the depths of my bowels. <laughs> so say that next time to the one you love and, <laughs> and see how, what, well, you could say, I love you from my gut. You know, that's, uh, but that, that's, the, that's the idea. And, and so, or how about the verse where Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with, Okay, so there's four parts. The strength, what, is, what part is that? Uh, okay, well, that's a good question. And even when we talk about spirit and soul, and as I ask the question, are they actual entities? You know, we, we see a lot of movies and things where, where somebody dies and their soul, their spirit, separates from their body. And if, if uh, you know, it's some kind of... Uh, criminal thing, they, they hang around for a while till things get reconciled and they go on to eternity. Um, is, that, is that what the Bible teaches? The, these are not yes and no answers, okay? Even though I, some are going like this, others are going like this, and I'm asking the question as yes or no. They're actually nebulous questions. They're actually questions that can be answered in different ways. And that's, that's what I'm trying to get at, that, that it's not as easy thing to kind of say, this is, this is the biblical view of what the body is like. Um, there are verses that talk about a separation of who we are from our bodies. Remember Paul said, better to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Um, he also talked about when we die, we, need, we want to be clothed. We don't want to be naked. The implication is that there is a period where we may be, quote, naked. We don't have a body. And so we're awaiting the resurrection. So what happens to us when we die as a Christian? The current heaven, <laughs> okay. Wait for the new heaven, the new earth. Okay. And that's where most, I think most people believe we'll receive our new bodies. Okay, so <laughs> the biblical view is, is resurrection. There will be a resurrection, but it hasn't occurred yet, at least in earthly time. See, and this is where it gets a little confusing, because with God there is no time. So from God's perspective, we could actually say the resurrection has actually already occurred. And there is a view that says that when we die, since we're now out of time, the resurrection will have occurred with us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 seems to imply that for us to be naked without a body is not a good thing. 
So some would say we actually sleep until the resurrection. Seventh-day Adventists, other uh, groups, uh, some which are more orthodox than others, believe in what's called soul sleep, that when you die, your soul actually sleeps until the resurrection. At the resurrection, you, your body is raised and it's changed, and your soul is also re reunited with your resurrected body. But until that time, you're actually <coughs> asleep. You're unconscious. So you're about, not aware. What about the verses that talk about martyrs and how they watch and they pray? And well, that's, long... that's why I don't believe in soul sleep, because I, I think there's too many verses that show that that, that isn't the case. And, and like Paul talks about how when we die, we are in the presence of the Lord, whatever that means, see, and, and how that means. Uh, but I don't, do not believe that we are in an unconscious state until the resurrection. But you can see how some would believe that if, if they put a real importance on um, how, the, how the Bible talks about the importance of the body and the soul. It's much more a Greek idea that the real you is not this body. The real you is what's inside this body. Your body is simply a tent that you live in, is, is, is a Greek view. And you can see if you, if you carry that view to its extreme, you could then either think um, the body is nothing, is not that important, and therefore you can live recklessly, or you can be consumed with your body on this earth because this is the only body you have on this earth. The biblical view is that you are a united person. And, and to me, this is, this is what we need to remember. And that's why if you have the notes I just gave out under Roman numeral three, the Constitution of Man, uh, there is, we did discuss the dichotomous and trichotomous view uh, remember when God created mankind, it says that he created man from the dust of the earth and he breathed into him the ruach, the spirit. So many believe that that's the dichotomous view, that it's body and spirit. But notice I have at least, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different things here. Body, soul, spirit, heart, mind, conscience, bowels, will, and emotions. And a lot of these things are part of other things. Exactly. But the Bible often separates them. Just like it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It doesn't distinguish what those are. It doesn't say that they're of equal quality with each other. They could be part of something else. But I think the idea is that we tend to see ourselves in these many different ways. So obviously when we think of body, first of all, that's pretty obvious. This is what we see. We see our bodies. And right now, um, there's, there's, I believe, um, a lot of wrong thinking about the human body. And, and the idea that, that the body is not that important, and that's why you can change it to whatever you want it to be. And so you read about people who will change their bodies uh, in their minds. They're changing their sex, their, their gender, I should say gender. Uh, but there's other people, um, I forget, I saw this picture of this lady that she had all these tattoos, all these piercings, and it was her, her desire to, I, I'm not sure what she wanted to be or to do, but she, she used, in a sense, her body as a canvas. And uh, I didn't think she was a very good artist, I guess is the best way to put it. But, but that's what happens. And so the body is, is something we understand very well. The soul, um, 
The Hebrew word is nefesh. Greek word is suke. Both those words have the idea of the life principle. That's the life principle within us. It's the center of our inner life. It's life itself. That's why uh, in Genesis it would say that when God created mankind, he breathed into him life and he became a living nephesh, a living soul. Spirit is the Hebrew word ruach and the Greek word pneuma. Some of these words you're, you may be familiar with. When we studied the Holy Spirit, it was pneumatology, which means spirit. Often uh, in Scripture, spirit is used in the same way as the soul. It's like the life principle. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 shows that this is the immaterial part of our body. It's the spirit. The heart is considered the center and the source of the inner life. It's the center of the spiritual, physical, mental aspects of our life. That's why we are to love God with all our heart. We are to worship God from our heart. So it's the idea that, that, that every part of our being loves God. That's, that's what the heart is referring to. The mind, of course, is referring primarily to the intellectual faculty. It's the capacity to think, the capacity to reason. So when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, that means deeply from your inner being. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. That means we are to love God intellectually. We don't love God mindlessly. Closely related to the mind is the conscience. The conscience is the inner awareness that judges moral actions. Romans chapter 2 verse 15 says how our conscience either judges us or in a sense tells us what we're doing is right. You can violate your conscience by going against what is there Paul says in Romans 2 also that people who are not uh, Jews, who do not have the law of God, still have the law of God written on their conscience. So the conscience is where God has written his moral law. Now obviously that's different in people. It's going to be affected by our cultural upbringing but it's that inner sense that we're doing something right or wrong. So we, we use expressions like, well, I have a guilty conscience. And the reason you have a guilty conscience is because there's something in you that says, I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm doing it. And because I'm doing it, now I feel bad about it. The Bible also talks about the fact you can have a seared conscience, meaning your conscience can get to the point where it no longer convicts you of the moral rightness or wrongness of your acts. In other words, the more you violate your conscience, the easier it is to not feel guilty anymore. And you, you get that from, you, you know, you've probably experienced it yourself, but you hear it from a lot of people. You hear people, they'll say, yeah, I started taking drugs. I knew that was not good, but the more I took them, it didn't seem to matter. And after a while, I enjoyed it so much, and it's such a part of my life now that I don't think anything wrong about it. See? So that's a seared conscience. That's a conscience that's been burnt over, in a sense. And the Bible says how, how dangerous that could be. Um... G, the bowels, this is primarily taken from the King James Version, 1 Corinthians 6.12, Philippians 1.8, Philippians 2.1, Colossians 3.12, and it mainly refers to the sense of affection towards somebody or something. And as I mentioned before, that's kind of a Greek notion. 
And then the last two I have are the will and the emotions. Obviously, the emotions, we often fit under the heart or even under the bowels. The will, we often associate with the mind, that that's part of the activity of the mind, that we are able to will something. So the whole point I'm trying to make is that as much as we can think of ourselves in terms of body and spirit, body, soul, and spirit, or however you want to do that, as much as you want to realize, and, and, and there is some truth to the fact that this body is a earthly tent, that when we die, this tent will, will disintegrate, but it will be resurrected to a new kind of body. And that body is both a spiritual body, but you'll be able to see it, just like the disciples were able to see the resurrected Jesus Christ. And they could touch his body, he could eat, but he could also go through doors, he could all of a sudden appear somewhere else. So we need to realize that there's, there's this connection between the immaterial and the material that's important in the Christian life. So here's a question to contemplate. Does Jesus have a body right now? Does it really matter? Does it matter? I think it does. Because it matters in the sense of how uh, that gives us the importance of the body. But then also, what happened at the ascension? When Jesus ascended into heaven, what does it say the disciples did? They could see him going up. It's not like he was there in front of them and all of a sudden he disappeared. Well, I understand that. I just mean like in heaven where it's God and him. What does it matter if you can see him or not? Well, it, it's not so much a matter of whether it's, they see him or not. See, here's the question, is, is Jesus still the God-man? If, if Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, which is what we talked about in Christology, is he that forever? Or did he go back to what he was before he was incarnated? I think the Bible shows that he's, he, he is the God-man forever. That's what distinguishes him from God the Father. And, and to me, that, that is a reason of why the body is important. And that's why Paul says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, he says that two different times. One time he's referring to the church. So he says the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But he also says your body, he doesn't say you, he says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, do not, do not go into sexual immorality. Very specific on that that you, you are discrediting the very temple of the Holy Spirit when you use your body for things that are contrary to the things of God. And like I said, there's, all through history, there's always been this conflict of how important is the body. And especially this day and age where for instance, I was just reading they're doing, they're doing um, research on um, an artificial womb. So, you know, they, they talk a lot about uh, can a man be pregnant? Well, if they create an artificial womb, conceivably that could happen one day. Even if that couldn't happen with a man, 
if you implant an artificial womb in a woman, what does that entail? What does that actually mean? Is that something that we should even be going after and searching after? We're not the author of life. Yeah. And God may, may make sure that it never happens. Who, who knows? But that's what mankind is going to do. Mankind is always going to be trying to do things that help him feel like he's God and that he can create life. He can do all these things. He doesn't need God. And, of course, there's always the idea, well, what about all those women who can't conceive? Now they could finally conceive and have their own child. See, and so, the, so the, there's, a, there's a whole, whole network of ethics that relate to our body. And, and as Christians, I think the more we understand what the Bible says about the Bible, the more uh, we, can, we can make the right decisions on, on those questions. All right, any thoughts, any comments on anthropology? Yes, go ahead. I don't quite understand this soul part. The soul part. That that never made sense. <laughs> never made sense. <laughs> okay, so are you more than your body? Yes. Okay, so what, what besides your body are you? Okay, there's mind. In the spirit. Let's see. Okay. I get a yeah. Yeah, well that, that all you're right. It is it is kind of hard to understand, but the soul and the spirit and that's why in the Bible soul and spirit sometimes are actually used interchangeably. And and to me the best way I like to describe it is that's the immaterial part of us. Okay. Well, it's the spirit or the soul. See again, if you, if if you if if you if you want to say that there we, that we have both a spirit and the soul and they're separate. Remember what it says in Hebrews that the word of God can divide between the spirit of the and the soul. That almost implies that you cannot divide, except the word of God can. But I don't think it's necessarily referring literally that you can divide the soul and the spirit. I think there is a connection between the soul and the spirit, like you said before. That, that, and, and like I said, when, in Genesis, when, when God breathed into Adam, it said he became a living soul. So um, there was something that God implanted within Adam that we, that's implanted in us. And of course, that, that whole issue relates to the abortion issue, for instance. So if you were to say, okay, so we should not abort a living being. Well, when does a, uh, a mass of tissue become a living being? What's that? Okay, there's, there's one view when you can detect a heartbeat. So if you can't detect a heartbeat, are they alive? Because, for instance, in, you know, way back in, in uh, 1000 AD, we didn't have the technology to detect heartbeats as early as we can now. Yeah, well, so you so would would you say you believe that life begins at conception? So there's another view. So life begins at conception. Life begins at when you can detect a heartbeat. Some believe that life begins, this is a common Jewish view, life begins when the baby takes its first breath. And they they relate that to Genesis where God put the breath into Adam. So this just shows, even among Bible-believing people and God-fearing people, there are differing views of when life begins in the fetus. 
But the reality is, once that baby is born, everyone would agree that that, that baby has life. Well, what, what does that mean to have life? It, it's more than just that this body is functioning, right? There's something inside. There's something immaterial about us. That's the soul. That's the spirit. Does that help any, or are you still just as confused? <laughs> or more confused, maybe? That verse is really good. What's that? that Hebrews 4.12. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Like, who could divide soul and spirit? Yeah. But, yeah, so if, if there is a division between the two, between the two, God is probably the only one who really knows what that means and can divide it. So, all right, any other thoughts, questions, comments? Okay, we're going to begin. <laughs> we're going to begin a, a section on soteriology, study of salvation. Uh, this is going to take a while because I believe this is very important. It's the crux of um, what we Protestants believe. Are you all Protestants? Do we even use that term anymore? Not really. Protestant Reformation, of course, is, was the recovery of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. At least that was one of the major doctrines, and that has all to do with salvation. So, Christ alone, Christ alone, Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, to the glory of God. So, I'm passing out what I titled the vocabulary of salvation. We're just going to go through a lot of these words. Some of them are going to be real familiar to you. Uh, others may be familiar, but there may be certain aspects of it you aren't aware of or uh, may be a little new to you. Others may be words that you kind of go, what in the world is that and why do we need to know that? Which is fine. <laughs> um, so, obviously the first one, salvation, which I've defined as freedom, deliverance from what binds us, to be rescued from a threatening situation. Specifically, when it talks about salvation, uh, spiritual salvation, it's being saved from eternal death and damnation to eternal life. It affects the whole person. The word salvation in Scripture doesn't always refer to spiritual salvation, doesn't always refer to being saved as we talk about. Um, Israel was saved from Egypt. Uh, God saves people who are in desperate conditions. The song we sang talked about uh, crying out to God in our desperation and he comes and he saves us, but it may not be uh, spiritual salvation. So salvation actually is a very broad term. You need to see the context of what it's in. Uh, but in our study here on soteriology, it's primarily spiritual salvation, being saved from eternal death and damnation to eternal life. Um, John chapter 3, the story of um, uh, when Jesus meets with Nicodemus is probably one of the most familiar passages that talk about this salvation and uh, probably some of the most familiar verses in scripture for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him so that's the salvation we're talking about calling the Bible talks about the fact that God calls people to salvation. There's what is called the general call, God's general invitation to men and women to come to him. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am humble of spirit. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. 
But then there's what's called the effectual call. That's God's selective invitation that only the elect respond to through faith, which results in salvation. Now, that's a very technical term. The effectual call is that call to salvation. It's called the effectual call because it ends in salvation. The general call is a call that can be rejected. Many believe that when God finally calls someone to salvation, you, you can't resist it. Now, we're going to talk a little more about that when we talk uh, about predestination, about the difference between what's often called Calvinism and Arminianism. But right now, the technical term effectual call is where God calls people to salvation. And, it's the, and the reason it's called effectual or effective is because it results in salvation. Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 30 is probably uh, one of the best passages that explains this. Um, it says there, and those that God predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So this verse kind of shows a, a, um, a, a pattern that's happening, a, a movement that's happening, that God predestines, and whoever he predestines to salvation, he calls them, and then those he calls, he justifies, and those he justifies, he also glorifies. Notice in this verse, there's nothing about faith. There's nothing about what you do. It's just in this verse what God does in the area of salvation. How many of you um, thank God for your salvation? Okay, almost everyone does. Do you do that because you earned your salvation, you did something to be saved, or are you thanking God because you realized he saved you. He did something in your life. Now, at the time you were saved, that's maybe not how you thought of it. You, you were brought to the place of repentance. You were brought to the place to believe. Maybe you said a prayer to accept Jesus into your heart. Maybe you went forward in a church service. Maybe you talked to somebody. Maybe you read a book. Maybe you read a passage of scripture and you said, wow, that's it, I believe. And at that moment, you feel like this is something I'm doing, but the longer you're a Christian, the longer you understand your salvation, you begin to say, well, thank you, Lord, for saving me. And so this, this passage, Romans 8.30, is in many ways the verse that shows us the power of God and that it is God who is the author of salvation. So that's what effectual call is. It's God's selective invitation that only the elect respond to through faith and which results in salvation. Some might recall the verse that Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. So in that passage, the word called there is referring to the general call. Many are called, but few are chosen. And as we used to say up in western New York in the winter, many are cold, but few are frozen. So, it's supposed to be funny. Oh, well. <laughs> okay, third one, regeneration. Uh, the work of God which gives new life to one who believes. Again, if you look at the John chapter 3 passage, remember Jesus comes to Nicodemus and he says... Uh, Remember, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, you know, hey, are you, are you really this prophet? Uh, should we be listening to you? And what's so important about you? And, and Jesus said, well, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And remember, remember, here's Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a religious leader, somebody who knows scripture, at least the scripture of that day. And he did not know what Jesus was talking about. But there's good reason to. There's not much in the Old Testament that talks about 
being born again. There's not much that talks about regeneration. And so, of course, uh, Nicodemus' response is, well, how can, how can somebody go back into the womb? So he looks at it only from a physical perspective. And that's when Jesus said, no, you have to be born of water and the Spirit. And that's where you get the phrase born again, which can also be translated born from above. So that's where we get our term regeneration, that God brings new life into a person. That's what is part of that salvation, that in order for a person to be saved, they need to be regenerated by God. Now, if you continue reading on in that passage, you'll know that you might say, well, just as Nicodemus said, how can a person be born into a mother's womb? In other words, how can a person be regenerated you know, the baby has no action in that, so what, what are we supposed to do? Well, it later on talks about that as you come to the passage, uh, verse 16, uh, uh, that God loved the world that whoever believes in him. So it's through faith that we receive that gift of regeneration. That's one way to look at it. Or you're regenerated and then you believe. We're going to talk a little more about that when we talk about what's called the order of salvation. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 also talks about this regeneration. Um, I used to know that by memory, but I forgot. Titus 3 5 says... He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So that's regeneration, being born again, the work of God which gives us new life to the one who believes. Okay, number four, redemption. To buy or purchase or pay a price for and set free. Jesus' death was the payment to purchase us from sin and Satan and to set us free. You guys are probably too young to uh, be aware of redemption stamps. Did you ever hear of green stamps? You used to go to the store, and when you bought your groceries, they would give you these stamps. And you'd start, you'd, you'd uh, glue these stamps into a little booklet, once your booklets got full, you could take it to the store and you could redeem those stamps for all kinds of merchandise. I mean, it's, it's really old. I, I can't. Know, but I, it was more of like a, a it's the same idea, but it was more of like a grand prize winner. Oh, yeah. You, you, yeah, you still do it now. For instance, if you, if you're, if you got a McDonald's app, <laughs> you can earn rewards. Almost any, any uh, fast food place now, uh, the, the more you buy, the more rewards you get, then you could redeem your rewards for more fast food, okay? So more junk food. Uh, so the idea of redemption is you, you purchase something. So the idea of redemption is you, there's, a, there's a price that has to be paid. There's something that needs to be rescued or redeemed or delivered there uh, you know with with the with the green stamps there are these merchandise in the store they're just sitting there and they're waiting for me to come with my book of stamps and say here i've got five thousand books so i can get that stereo set say something like that so that that stereo set was just sitting there it was a prisoner in in the redemption center until somebody came and paid the price. So when we think of redemption, Jesus paid the price. We are the ones who are enslaved. You could say we were enslaved to sin, or we were enslaved to Satan, or you can say both. Jesus paid the price. A payment had to be made. So the question is, who did he make the payment to? 
And we'll be talking some more about this when we talk about the different theories of the atonement. But the payment was made to Satan. Maybe. Payment was made to God. See, so there's, there's different views here. But that's what redemption is all about. Something is enslaved in order for it to be free. A price had to be paid. Somebody had to pay the price. Once the price was paid, that person is now delivered and is free. So, all right, we'll stop there and uh, continue at 11 o'clock. All right. You're welcome.